On the surface, Corsicana's municipal airport seems no more remarkable than hundreds of other small rural airfields across the country. But like many similar fields, most of which have vanished, Corsicana serves as an account of how one small community became part of a nationwide program whose genius played a large, even vital role in defeating the Axis powers of World War II. It was a program that sprang from the weeds of depression and despair into fields of hope. century ago with World War I. This costly experience, referred to as the war to end all wars, was anything but that. It left the world unknowingly poised for a repeat performance. The seeds had been sown after Germany's surrender and the harsh reparations imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. Although the United States was drawn into the war towards its end, the bloody conflict left Americans weary of war, and isolationism became the new standard. World War I had been devastating. Uh, we had over 100,000 American casualties in World War I. Uh, and there had been a significant pushback from any kind of involvement in foreign affairs. Um, in fact, the, the Congress passed a number of neutrality acts during the 20s and 30s. Uh, so as not to pull us into, into foreign conflicts. And also, uh, we even refused to join the League of Nations, which was the brainchild of uh, President Wilson. Even during this time of isolation, there was a push within the military for the expansion of air power as the future of warfare. But at that time, aviation was considered supplemental to ground and naval forces. It was to be used for coastal patrol, reconnaissance and battlefield support. The future of U.S. air power was to become a complex political battle, but the use of the airplane was on its way to changing forever. Well, the, the first real warning came in the early 1920s with a, uh, an Army officer named Billy Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell realized the importance the airplane was going to play in, in any upcoming war and he tried to uh, convince the government they needed to do something. Uh, General Billy Mitchell was a proponent of air power based on his experiences during the First World War. Uh, he could foresee the development of the Japanese Air Force and other countries that saw the need for a strong air force. He attempted to push the uh, military arm of the U.S. government, the Army, and the Navy towards developing an air arm uh, that could carry the fight to the enemy uh, should the, uh, the occasion arise. Uh, he was met with uh, disdain and uh, a counter, the, the, the counterculture at that time was the Navy was the primary fighting arm of the United States. And so they opposed his efforts to switch that into an air arm uh, as much as they could. He developed or staged uh, an a, a event where he had an aircraft drop bombs on uh, an old naval ship and successfully sunk the ship. Uh, even at that, uh, did not convince the U.S. government they needed to shift their motivation toward air away from Navy. Uh, and he was very verbal and, and uh, pushed his theory to the point of uh, disgrace on him. He began to complain and, and uh, finger some accusations uh, that led to his court-martial and, and ultimate dismissal from the military. Uh, but it was not until 1935 that we really began to realize that uh, Mitchell was correct. But history intervened. 
Just 10 years prior to the start of World War II, financial disaster struck, and the crash of the New York stock market ushered in a decade of Great Depression. By 1931, unemployment in the United States had reached 12 million, over 15.8% of the workforce. It would grow to almost 25% by 1933 and stay above 16.8% for the rest of the decade. Food lines grew at a time when overgrazing and poor farming practices turned the Midwest breadbasket into the Great Dust Bowl. But the Depression was not limited to creating suffering in the United States. The financial catastrophe spread throughout the world and hit hard the already struggling post-war Germany. There, the growing Nazi party thrived on the economic misery of its citizens and eventually gained power. The short-sighted desire to punish instead of reconcile allowed the militaristic ideologies and expansionist policies of Nazi Germany to bear fruit and find common cause with Italy and Japan in reshaping the world to their own image, an alliance that became known as the Axis powers. With his growing power, Adolf Hitler had bargained with European politicians to obtain what he desired in return for the promise of peace. But by September of 1939, this appeasement ended when Germany invaded and occupied Poland in just 18 days with their lightning warfare, firmly setting the term Blitzkrieg in the international vocabulary. In response, France and Britain went to war with Germany. In the United States, the people gave a collective sigh of relief when President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared that the nation would remain neutral in Europe's squabbles. For the most part, the country turned its eyes back to the task of recovering from a decade where dreams turned to dust in America's heartland, and the Rust Belt turned to soup kitchens for survival. The dark days of the Depression, mixed with existing anti-war sediments, created deep and fast currents in the national psyche. Budget expenditures in such a time of need could be better used at home. And as Congress has often demonstrated, when there is a budget crunch, the first victim tends to be the military. In late 1939, as the war continued overseas, Congress repealed the arms embargo provisions of the neutrality laws. Arms began to flow to France and Britain, but the war was already going badly. It was only a matter of time before the United States would be drawn directly into the conflict, and preparations were moving forward for that anticipated involvement. The Army Air Corps, under the command of General H.H. H. Hap Arnold, was tasked with the job of reinventing and enlarging the flying services. The Army Air Corps was training only about 500 to 750 pilots a year. General Arnold quickly pointed out that the United States' capacity to train and supply an adequate air arm did not exist. I advise our nation to arm for air defense immediately. France and England must now realize that they began too late. Let us not make that same mistake. I urge them that all remember this. A strong air force may go a long way toward keeping America out of war. Also, a strong air force is absolutely essential to keep war out of America. Well, there's, a, there's an expression that says de desperate times call for desperate measures. And Arnold is in a desperate situation. I mean, he's been given this charge to get, get these pilots ready to go. And so what, what other choice does he have? The military can't meet, meet this demand. With time running out and Congress reluctant to act, General Arnold took a bold step. In May of 1939, uh, General Arnold called the eight uh, major civilian flight school directors to a meeting at the munitions building in Washington, D.C. And in that meeting, which lasted about five minutes, uh, he basically told these men, I need you to train uh, military or army pilots uh, 
for the country. I can't guarantee you any reimbursement for it. Uh, you're just gonna have to trust us. But this is what we're trying to sell and we need you to do it for us. And when he first proposed this idea, uh, he, he made the comment that, that his uh, staff considered it rather balmy. You know, that's, that's a crazy idea. Uh, we've never done that before. The, the old expression, we, we've never done that before. Well, what, what other choice do we have? It was a huge professional risk for Arnold. Would the civilians do the training, even if the Army could not guarantee to pay them at the time, or perhaps ever? If the Army asks, would they expand their facilities and enlarge their fields at their own expense to get the job done? And the most pressing question, could they train the average American male to fly, even someone who has never seen an airplane before? General Arnold received an absolute yes to all three questions, something he might have expected knowing the men in the room. But the task, as Arnold foresaw, would be Herculean. And his parting comment after the end of the meeting expressed both faith and fear in just 11 words. If you let me down on this, God help us all. And essentially, the eight men had been pushing for this very thing, and they were uh, hoping that this meeting would be the okay to do this. And so they were happy to hear that they had the okay and went back and began preparations for doing this. Uh, and they were basically working on their own at that point. Uh, but with the moral support, of the upper echelon of the Army. While the flight school owners were full of confidence, they soon learned that taking a young man right off the farm or out of a factory and teaching them to fly was not a slam dunk proposition. By June of 1940, France had fallen to Germany. Roosevelt pushed for a major military buildup, though again, Congress was slow to act. Instead, they created the Lend-Lease program to aid allied nations, most immediately Britain, which now stood alone against the Axis powers. And so we did furnish some, some military supplies without having to get involved with actually sending our boys over there. Uh, Roosevelt convinced Congress to uh, make the United States a great arsenal of democracy. And so some money was allocated and appropriated for, for that purpose without having to get directly involved. But we, we did very little as far as uh, direct, direct involvement in the war until uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. With America's capacity to produce hundreds of thousands of tanks, airplanes, and ships for its allies, it also became better able to supply its own army and navy. Approval was eventually passed by Congress giving the president the power and authority to proceed with the civilian-operated flight schools. The civilian contractors would provide the location, the facilities, the equipment, the logistical support, such as food, fuel, medical care, transportation, and anything else that had to do with operating a training field. The civilian contractor was, was to provide all of that. The one thing that the initial flight school operators complained about was they could train pilots, but they couldn't maintain the airplanes well enough or, or keep the airplanes up well enough to have enough pilots go through. So part of this contract was that the Army provided the aircraft. And any maintenance done on the aircraft, if it was not field maintenance, would be sent to an Army contract facility. So that relieved the contractor of having to maintain or, or that cost of maintaining the aircraft, which made it viable for them to provide everything else. Uh, and so the Army provided the aircraft, the Army provided the military contingency, the check pilots, link trainers, uh, the Army provided those, and the link trainer instructors. The link trainers were known as blue boxes. They were uh, the first flight simulators uh, that were used, and the because of spates of bad weather that they had in, in this part of Texas, there were days when no flying could be done. So on those days, the upper class of, of cadets could utilize that time and get some instrument 
flying time in the link trainers, which advanced, that's one thing about this school that put it above the others is they had that capability. Records indicate that there were 50 some primary facilities constructed based on the successful process developed by the original eight flight schools that General Arnold approached in 1939. There were dozens of these schools uh, throughout the country, primarily located in uh, weather predictable regions so that they could guarantee uh, so many days of flying uh, in, a, in a year's time. Uh, so consequently, Texas had uh, dozens of primary schools in the state alone. Oklahoma had, had many, Arkansas. Uh, they were spread out through the southern region, the southeast region, the, the central area, Kansas had some. Uh, and then across the southwest uh, toward California, there were not as many because of the altitudes they were dealing with. but. There were some primary schools out in there, but Texas by far had the most uh, because of the, the flat landscape and the uh, agreeable weather conditions. Corsicana, Texas joined the ranks in the second wave of training school construction after the system was proven successful. Air Activities of Texas was built on the model of the original eight aviation schools established at the beginning of the program. This was based on the idea that the formula for success is to find a system that works and to duplicate it. If you can train your people on the system quickly and efficiently, then your chances of success are greatly multiplied. Air Activities of Texas was created by uh, investors from the Dallas area, B.L. Woolley and his cousin B.W. Woolley, and their cousin E.D. Criddle were the initial uh, financial men that invested in the Air Activities facility. The Air Activities of Texas was the uh, product of purchasing Air Activities of Houston, which belonged to Mr. Reed, uh, who was a friend of the Woolies. The, uh, they also had uh, Edward Booth and uh, J.O. Womack were also investors in the purchase the Booth and Womack had aviation backgrounds. Uh, the Woolies and Criddle had, were oil uh, investors, and that was their background. So the combination of the, the two different entities uh, created the Air Activities of Texas. They had to meet Army specifications uh, as far as meeting the contract, as in providing all the, the things we mentioned before. Uh, and the Army side of the contract would be to provide the cadets and the aircraft uh, and would compensate the investors for every cadet hour of flight. And that varied throughout the war, and there were some times when the investors didn't know if they were going to be paid or not. The, it started out as an investment opportunity. It became a patriotic endeavor. While the Army dictated the training program specifications and content, much of the decisions into finding suitable locations and establishing the logistics was left in the hands of the civilian contractors. Uh, Corsicana was selected by the investors uh, because they had some uh, interest in the area, uh, being from the Dallas area, and uh, uh, Mr. Criddle was from the Waxahachie area. Uh, so they knew, they were familiar with this general region. The Army didn't have a direct hand in site selection. They set forth certain parameters that they felt would make it an, uh, a more amenable location. Uh, and what most of these schools looked for in site location was rail access, highway access, uh, in order to get the cadets from San Antonio to the school. Uh, they were usually located near a town that could provide water and sewage, that type of thing. Uh, this field had their own sewer system, but water was supplied by Corsicana. That field was just an open pasture. It was a 400 acre tract owned by a local banker here named uh, uh, Eddins, uh, Paul Eddins. Uh, and it was a tank farm where they stored uh, 
for them. During the construction of the field, the, the primary difficulty that was faced uh, came to be the weather, uh, the rain and the mud. There were uh, berms, uh, and literally dozens of berms, circular berms, uh, over this whole site. Those had to be bulldozed, and the rubble from those scattered, and, and the field leveled, and all this was done. Uh, they had to cart the materials in through the mud and the rain. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, job to do. It was, the field was constructed by the Stover brothers, who Mr. Woolley had gone to Cal Arrow in California and talked to those, uh, which was one of the eight primary uh, schools that Hap Arnold had contacted. Uh, and he talked to those folks and they recommended the Stover brothers and they're the ones that constructed the field with Corsicana's help. The city of Corsicana provided uh, earth movers and uh, anything that, that they needed to construct the field, the city was willing to pitch in and do. They started in February of 1941. And that day is significant. We don't get into the war until December of 41, which indicates we, we can see it coming and we better get ready. We were not prepared at all when we entered World War I. And we didn't want to get caught in that situation again. So let's go ahead and start getting ready now. Uh, uh, the first group of cadets came in in, in the March. When the first cadets arrived, there were uh, six buildings completed. And obviously that's going to expand significantly. There were, there were 18 airplanes and 22 instructors. At the height of this, the, the peak, uh, which would be about, oh, mid-1944, there were 199 airplanes and 164 instructors. So that's, that's how it, rapidly it grew. But, but it was difficult to, just to get the thing operational. When the first cadets arrived, facilities were not ready. So they were told to check in at the Navarro Hotel. Uh, that's where they're gonna stay for a few days until their barracks were ready to occupy. Uh, they, they ate their meals there at the, at the hotel. Uh, it, it took a while to get, get everything stabilized, uh, but uh, did a remarkable job in getting the thing up in just six weeks, uh, ready, ready to occupy. The administration building was the first building you saw as you came in the main gate. Uh, and, and it, of course, was where the offices of the administrators were, the civilian operators. Uh, and from that, it branched out uh, down two rows. Behind the administration building was the parade ground, uh, which was an open area uh, just for that, for drilling and for assembly. Uh, down the sides of the parade ground were uh, fingers of the, the long barracks. Uh, and the, the classrooms and the mess hall and those were to the side of the parade ground. The, uh, the barracks were uh, uh, rooms. They, they weren't long barracks like military uh, uh, design. They were actually uh, nicely built rooms and each room housed uh, four cadets with bunk beds and study tables and lamps. It was very, the, the amenities were very nice for the cadets. Um, they weren't responsible for cleaning. They had uh, people come in and clean their rooms every day. And uh, uh, the cadets that left here that we've talked to said, yeah, they left, left the hotel of Corsicana and went to their next station would be a military station with tar covered ba uh, barracks and the wind blowing through it. So Corsicana was a very nice facility and, and it was built to make it comfortable for the cadets, to make learning uh, easier for them. Politicians had struggled with the belief that the American people would not support direct involvement in another foreign war. But everything changed on December 7th, 1941. The attack on Pearl Harbor and Hitler's declaration of war on the United States four days later quickly changed public opinion. The squabble over budget allocations and isolationism came to an end, and the attack on Hawaii provided a gruesome example of how air power could project war far beyond national borders. Now, World War II provided uh, opportunities for the airplane as, as an actual weapon of war. Now, World War I, you had these incidental dogfights that really had very little to do with the outcome. World War II allowed you to take the war to your enemy. 
uh, not only to, to bomb military bases, but also to target the civilian population. With the involvement of the United States in the war against the Axis powers, the need for pilots had become a reality that so many dreaded. The nation was now fighting in both the Eastern and the Western hemispheres, and the need for aviators grew at an incredible rate. It is estimated that 200,000 American pilots would eventually be needed to prosecute the war, not to mention those that were to be trained here for our allies. Air activities of Texas would certainly train its share of both. And as the war progressed, the classes got bigger and bigger, so that by 1943, 44, they're bringing in classes of 300, 350 cadets. They come from all over the United States. We even had one group come in from Mexico. There was a group coming in from Brazil. Um, and these are just guys who really have limited or no experience at all in, in, in flying an airplane. I remember talking to a couple of them. Uh, and they just said, this, uh, this sounds exciting. I'd rather do this than uh, march and carry a rifle. When President Roosevelt called up the National Guard and Reserve Forces in August 1940, he also signed the Selective Training and Service Act. The Army Air Corps saw a flood of volunteers set on choosing their area of service rather than being assigned to an unknown branch by the draft board. The Air Corps went from 20,503 personnel on July 1, 1939, to 152,569 two years later, outpacing the Army's 1939 goal of training 1,200 pilots, which increased to 7,000 in 1940 and 30,000 in 1941. By the fall of 1941, the Army Air Corps set sights on training 50,000 pilots a year, then revising the total to 70,000 with matching demands for gunners, navigators, bombardiers, ground technicians, and of course, flight instructors. Before January 1939, the Army had 17 air bases. By the peak of World War II in 1943, the number had expanded to 783 main bases, sub-bases, and auxiliary fields. At that time, the psychological shock to the recruits was as unsettling as seeing the Earth from a thousand feet up in a plane with an open cockpit. But some people relished the idea of flying. One such pilot was Vern Foster a civilian who jumped at the opportunity to work as a flight instructor. His road to Corsicana started on the ground with a job driving a truck. I drove that job for three and a half years. And then I frequented the FAA office in Kansas City, Missouri, because that's where I had an apartment. I was single at that time, I might add and rode the streetcar to, to work. And uh, <clears throat> I would go down there on uh, afternoons and uh, because my truck didn't go out till it was loaded about nine o'clock. And I would go down in, in the afternoon, maybe at three o'clock or four o'clock and spend two or three hours reading accidents and reports. But the trim light, the um, main line to that is that I became well acquainted with the head inspector of the FAA. So time went on, and it was June, about June of the, uh, uh, around June 1 of 1942 in Kansas City, Missouri, and I walked in the door of the FAA office and this guy said, Foster, I've just had a call from the operator, FBO at Lawrence, Kansas, and he's running a government paid instructor training school to prepare instructors to be Army primary civilian instructors 
and would you have 165 hours? Now I'll come back to that in just a minute. And I said, well, I think I have. His name was Frank. And I said, I think I have. Yeah, yeah, I got that. And he says, well, I've just hung up the phone from this man in Lawrence, Kansas, and he short one guy for his next class on June the, the 15th. And he, he says, how about I just call him up and say you're interested? Well, he rang him up and that guy said he's interested. <clears throat> and uh, I said, hell up. He said, you got to take a check ride though. So it's early afternoon now this day, it's about two o'clock. So I hurriedly rented the little air, training airplane that I flew a lot and uh, jumped in that son of a bitch and flew out to Lawrence, Kansas. And he took me for a check ride and accepted me into the class. And I went back then and uh, of course, drove my, my trip that day because I went, didn't, you never saw the boss of the truck line very often. And because I was down there departing at nine o'clock in the, in the night. But when the time had come around, I went in and told him that I was resigning the 15th of June to go to Lawrence, Kansas and take training. And I quit and took my car. I, I had my only possession was a 39 Plymouth Coupe painted black that I was buying for $7 a week. And I got in that and went out to Lawrence, Kansas with my last paycheck and rendered me a sleeping room and took that course in a Waco UPF-7. After Vern Foster's initial schooling in Lawrence, Kansas, he was sent to the U.S. Army Central Flight Instructors School at Kelly Field in Texas to continue his training. There we flew the PT-19 for the first time. Well, that was nothing to check out in. I'd flown the Waco UPF-7 biplane and it was a lot harder to fly than this. So uh, we went to work and uh, went through the program pretty good. Anyway, on this morning, my instructor came by and he said, Foster, we've, we're supposed to uh, graduate an instructor from this course today because they need an instructor at Corsicana, Texas. Well, hell, I didn't even, I had never even heard the word Corsicana before. And he said, I know that you're, uh, that the course is 35 hours and you're entitled to all that. And you've only got 25, seven, but I'm gonna put you up for a graduation check ride right today. I passed the son of a bitch and I got my, uh, my last paycheck and <coughs> looked at the road map and found out where Corsicana was and got my uh, uh, stamps for gasoline and went down and got some gas in my car and I hit for Corsicana, Texas. I started working for here in Corsicana in uh, early October, 1942. They handled 400 cadets at a time here. Had 100 airplanes and 100 instructors. This was a big, big operation. So anyway, they had a, 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 a fellow here. He was a real nice guy, Mr. Calkins, C-A-L-K-I-N-S and he was their standardization instructor. And they wanted all the instructors to do everything just the same as he did. And that, that's a good thing, of course. And so they said, well, you've, you've got, uh, we've got you signed up for a week with the standardization instructor. Well, he had, an, uh, <clears throat> he would brief me and we'd go fly maybe two hours, one hour before 
one hour in the forenoon and one hour in the afternoon. And we did a lot of briefing and talking. And he turned me loose. So then immediately on the next Monday morning, they had a big class of guys. And when the class showed up, they came in and brought us and we, we got them all sitting in the, in the hangar and they would call an instructor and he'd stand up and he would peel off five cadets and take them with him to his airplane. And uh, then we did that to all, see we had two classes going at one time. We had one advanced class and one finishing class and that solved the scheduling problem because if we had two beginning classes, we wouldn't have enough instructors or airplanes to do them. So they are all set like this. One cadet assigned to Corsicana Field was New Jersey native Stan Walsh, who joined the Air Corps at age 19. I grew up in Lakewood, New Jersey, and uh, it's in the pine, on the edge of the Pine Barrens, about 60 miles south of New York, and about the same distance from Philadelphia. Well, you can imagine uh, living near the Navy all uh, growing up, we were very pro-Navy. And so I went to New York, the war had started, and I wanted to enlist, and I got all the papers from the Naval recruiting, and uh, I had to bring them home for parents to sign the okay. So uh, I was doing that, and this evening, uh, my buddy phoned and he said, have you seen the New York news? I know, no, what's up? He said, well, the Army has lowered its uh, requirements for pilot training if you can pass the exam. So I immediately <laughs> burned the Navy papers and contacted the Army and I took the exam and uh, two of us out of 40 uh, passed the exam. And uh, so we were uh, invited to join the Air Corps. And uh, about a month later, uh, they sent me a telegram uh, to report, and I was off and running uh, down to Texas on uh, the Southern uh, Railway. And it was a long ride through Appalachia and across Texas down to San Antonio, uh, Kelly Field. And anyway, then uh, after a few months indoctrination, and drilling, uh, I was sent to Corsicana, Texas. And that's how I got there. Ray Blake Jr. of West Virginia was another young man who had his eyes set on the sky. Prior to World War II, he was a full-time student and he attempted to enlist in the Army immediately after graduation. He needed to be 18 years old before you could enlist and I was 17 years old when I graduated from high school, so I had to wait a while before I could join the service. I became an Air Corps cadet by enlisting through the draft board into the service. Well, I was like everybody else. It was my country, and I was very interested in getting in the service to do what little bit I could do. Another cadet that began his flight training at Corsicana Field was Virgil Radcliffe. His nephews, Gary Metz and Jeff Radcliffe, have taken great care to study and preserve their uncle's journey through the Air Corps. He wanted to be uh, uh, a pilot. Um, he actually uh, had dropped out of high school um, during the Depression to help the family uh, earn some money. Um, I think um, he was inspired, I think, to be um, a pilot um, early on. I think um, probably when he was younger, um, he was looking to, um, Charles Lindbergh happened to actually um, come visit uh, an area near where, where our family um, lived, and they all went out to, to meet and greet. And, and I think at that point in time, like it may have been for my generation, um, heroes were astronauts. Um, these guys were, were the astronauts of their day. And I think that kind of gave Virgil the idea he wanted to be a pilot. So he went, uh, he went back to 
high school after being gone for a year or two. And uh, then uh, at the time, uh, I had to go to college to get a couple years of uh, college education before the uh, Army Air Corps would even accept him into the program. This was their first time in an airplane. They had gone to uh, Randolph Field in Texas and learned basic military etiquette. So this was the second step, but it was the first step in flying. So they were flying the, the trainers first time in the air. They got here about November, um, middle, middle of November, and they were here until mid-January, January being 1942. They were here at the time of Pearl Harbor. Even cadets from the Army's prestigious West Point were sent to Corsicana Field and others like it to receive their primary flight training. There were a number of West Point cadets that trained here from 1943 to 44. Uh, the, the way that worked is they were uh, in the academy as in a regular uh, system. Uh, they chose to go to the Air Corps uh, and once they were accepted as pilots, would, then they had to go through the same rigorous program that any cadet did to be accepted. Then they were sent down here and other primary schools to go through the primary phase. Once they completed the primary phase, they went back to Stewart Field in uh, New York at the academy and completed their basic and advanced phases of training. And then after that, they went through transition training just like everybody else did in the Army. Not only do the people of Texas get to meet cadets from around the country, but from around the world as well. An important part of the training focused on foreign nationals. The Goodwill Act of 1938 gave the federal government or its agencies the authorization to train a limited number of Latin American students. The Lend-Lease Act of 1941 expanded the training of foreign nationals by stipulating the president as commander-in-chief, had the authority to permit forces under his command to instruct others in matters of defense which are vital to the security of the United States. This opened the door for more foreign students to enter the pilot training program. Between 1941 to the end of 1945, at least 21,000 airmen from 31 foreign nations graduated from flying in technical schools in the United States. In the process, Air Activities of Texas saw its share of foreign pilots pass through its gates. We trained foreign students on Lend-Lease, and we trained uh, them throughout the system. We didn't have, uh, we had some, some schools had Chinese, we had Brazilians, and a, a, typically an instructor would have three American boys and two Brazilians. And they were with us uh, during the complete 10-week training, and the, there was uh, probably, I, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 of them and intermingled with our class. And there was about, through the course of a year and a half, uh, about 300 to 350 Brazilians that came through here. When they came to the field, they were already officers in the Brazilian Air Force. Uh, and they were going through the U.S. training system uh, because we had the equipment to do it. Uh, and they would end up flying U.S. aircraft and be assigned to U.S. Uh, fighter groups uh, overseas. We actually had naval bases in Brazil, uh, which were jump off points for our aircraft to go down and cross the Atlantic to, uh, to Africa. Uh, so the Brazilians were our allies from the very beginning. The other nationality were Mexicans uh, trained here. Uh, the Mexican Air Force sent five uh, officers here to learn to be instructors. Um, during the time they were here, one of the cadets uh, died in a plane crash. So four completed the training and went back to Mexico where they, in turn, trained in PT-19s, trained the Mexican uh, Air Force cadets uh, down there. And they went on to be uh, part of the 201st uh, Aero uh, Squadron that flew in the Philippines with, in support of American troops. 
Uh, the Mexicans had a policy of non, uh, non-aggression on foreign soil, so it was a, it was a difficult task uh, for President Roosevelt to convince the Mexican president that they needed to get, get in the war on our side. Uh, and then the Germans sank uh, several Mexican oil tankers. And at that point, they committed to joining the war effort on behalf of the U.S. And that's when uh, they brought their cadets up here to be trained and, uh, and eventually fought with U.S. forces. Although their training was handled by a civilian flight instructor, the education Army cadets were exposed to was quite different from the one a civilian would encounter while learning to fly. To compare a civilian flight school to a military flight school, this being one of them, uh, it's pretty hard to do because the military school was so disciplined and the lesson outlines were, were on Monday you gave this guy this, whether he wanted to have it or not. And in a civilian school, why it's all loose and a guy might fly today and the hell he might fly the next week and he might go a month and not fly and then fly. But the uh, continuity of the program just beaten, beaten, beaten on these kids and it was an accelerated program. And to think that guys with 55 total hours not only flew all the precision maneuvers, but could do aerobatics in that damn airplane. They had the last 20 hours of their training in Corsicana and all these other airplanes was aerobatics, loops and snap rolls, split asses, flying upside down because they, they needed to see when we shot down people in World War II. It was just like hunting quail. You just went out and kind of taught yourself to, to, how, how much to lead the guy and pull the trigger, and a lot of times you missed. And, uh, or they would tow a banner behind uh, another airplane with a thousand foot cord. Well, if, if the, the banner's moving at a, a steady straight, a straight course, any damn fool can hit that banner, but when the when your enemy is doing loops and snap rolls and good God diving and all this, you've got to learn how to fly that. Fly that. So that's why they were given aerobatics. On the proficiency level, they were be, they were better pilots than the private pilot license. As the program moved forward, younger instructors arrived at the facilities who had trained at Randolph Field. These men had been educated in more rigorous Army standards. This facilitated in replacing some of the more lax civilian instructors among the ranks. And, and as the war went on, the older instructors, or the, the, the age of the instructors was younger and younger. And the younger the instructor that came in had already been through the same flying program at Randolph as uh, the cadets would have done before the civilian training school. So they came into the, the picture having been trained in a military way of flying. So as the war progressed, that became less of a problem. Uh, but the idea was to get as many cadets through the program as possible. And, and so the experience of the older, cadet, older instructors uh, was beneficial. Uh, and calming these young cadets and, and making, reassuring them that they could do the job. The need for flight instructors at primary flight schools was a given, but these facilities also needed ground instructors, mechanics, administrative personnel, etc. Not to mention logistical essentials required to support such a facility, such as groceries, uniforms, and other supplies. All these were often found in the communities in which the fields were located. At its peak, it employed about 500 civilians, uh, not, not besides the flight instructors. It was a little self-contained community. Uh, you had carpenters and plumbers and barbers and cooks and clerical people. Um, uh, 
and, and, and we had local vendors who were selling uh, their merchandise to uh, George Baum, who, who owned the Big Four shoe store here in town, had a contract to provide footwear for the, for the cadets out there. Uh, and, and other local vendors uh, provided various, various items, uh, groceries and food and whatever else. So it, it had a big impact on the, uh, uh, on the local economy. The instructors that were hired uh, at Corsicana uh, were mainly just uh, uh, educators in the general you know, classroom educators. And that was really how they acquired their, their teaching staff. And, and as the war, as the, the base was here longer, you had more folks applying for a specific job. They used a lot of public school teachers uh, to, to do this teaching. Uh, I remember talking to a, a remarkable lady named Margaret Paddle. Ms. Paddle had a very distinguished career here at Navarra College. She was an English teacher. And at the time, she was teaching in uh, Corsicana Junior High, I think. She taught music and English. And they approached her about teaching at the airfield. And she said, well, I don't know anything about airplanes and meteorology and whatever. And they said, well, we can teach you what you need to teach. Can you teach? And she got somewhat offended, <laughs> questioning her teaching ability. And she said, well, of course I can teach. And so she signed on, and she taught out there for the, the duration of the, of the period it was operational. She said, I, I'd go home every night and prepare. I stayed about one day ahead of those cadets. But I taught meteorology, and I taught plane identification, and I taught various other things related to, uh, to what those, those men needed to, needed to know. We had uh, uh, an instructor, a, a lady, sh uh, teaching us navigation. It was dead reckoning, uh, where you that's using your time and distance and, and heading on the campus to determine your course and where you are. And we learned how to do that and use the uh, computer, uh, that is a, a little plastic affair. Uh, no electronic computers <laughs> in those days. As with many occupations during the war, women served in many areas at Corsicana Field, some as ground instructors as previously mentioned, but also in a vast array of other positions as well. The women were an essential part of Corsicana Field, the, uh, other than uh, the uh, secretarial duties that they provided for the administrators and all. Uh, women at Corsicana uh, served as mechanics, they served as parachute riggers and packers and uh, worked in the control tower, the scheduling towers. Uh, they basically every function that was done out here uh, had male-female participation in it. The dangers inherent in flying are great and many of the new recruits had never been close to a plane before. The first flight was something both exciting and terrifying. It's hard to avoid the stories about training. In the Second World War, 23,000 planes were lost in combat, but another 14,000 were lost in the continental US, many in training accidents. All of this made stepping into the cockpit for the first time both a highly anticipated and greatly feared event. And so uh, we met our instructor, and uh, so he briefed us and showed us the Fairchild PT-19 and how it worked. And so uh, we, uh, we took off. He, uh, took you off and he went through some maneuvers to see, I know, if you'd get air sick. And uh, I didn't, so I was okay. After passing this test, came the cadet's first opportunity to take the controls for himself. You're handling the controls. Of course, the instructor is right there showing you what to do and you learn how to steer straight because of the uh, torque of the engine. Uh, and little, little things like that, you pick them up in a, in a hurry. And so uh, the first flight was really pleasant. The airplane chosen for a majority of primary training was the open cockpit Fairchild PT-19. 
Its design was simple, quick to produce, and saved the Army precious dollars that could be used elsewhere. The Army chose to use open cockpit airplanes is, was mainly for the simplicity of the airframe design. It uh, reduced the production time. Uh, the, the cost of the aircraft was a lot less uh, because it had less material in it. The PT-19, for example, was a wood and fabric aircraft on a steel frame, uh, open cockpit. When the cadets left here, they, they accumulated 60 hours of flying time in the PT-19. My initial instruction, a type plane was a single engine, open, open cockpit, uh, pretty much of a, uh, you'd say, not much of an airplane as far as power goes or anything, but it was a good starter. Remember, these were raw recruits, many of whom had never been higher off the ground than a State Fair Ferris wheel. They get lost. You know, you don't have instruments. So you just kind of have to fly looking down below and, and find the landmarks that you could identify. There's, there's a funny story about a, uh, a cadet and, a, and an instructor, and they got lost, and they, they finally just landed way over by Hubbard over there. Uh, 30 miles from, from Corsicana. Uh, my instructor said, okay, uh, which way, uh, we're gonna do a forced landing, which way is the wind blowing? And I immediately <laughs> looked up in the clouds, and of course, naturally, you're going through the clouds, there's no way you could tell how the wind was blowing. And so uh, then he corrected me, he says, no, 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 that's, you look at the ground and you see if you can see a flag or smoke and that's how you tell which way the wind is blowing, and you want to force land in, into the wind. So you learn that in a hurry. The Army designated certain fields for specific training purposes. Some were for advanced training, some for gliders, and some for multi-engine bombers. But whatever the use, each field actually was a collection of fields used for different purposes. There was the main field, a satellite field, and often several auxiliary fields. They were used to allow the Army to put more planes into the air during the training day. They were also used for emergencies where planes could land if they could not return to the main field. Usually, the auxiliary fields were not equipped with facilities that the main field boasted, including housing and mess halls. Most of these were grass fields with little more than parallel stripes down the edge as markers. The main field, of course, had the heaviest traffic because we all took off at once, we say at once, but it would just be a big cloud of dirt when a hundred airplanes, they would be going down across the the grass out here, uh, a, a city block apart, and there would be one here, one here, one here, one here. A half a mile behind me would be another, another four or five, and there was just a wave of these guys going. Well, then the, the at the noon hour, see, we we had uh, the noon, uh, the, the morning flight, and then we had the afternoon flight, and the kids that took the, the ground school was opposite the flight. If you took ground school in the morning, you flew in the afternoon and so forth. Then when you came in <clears throat> for noon, it was like a beehive out here. This, the airplane, <laughs> the sky would be full of airplanes and, and we had to be so careful because we didn't have radios, didn't have lights. We just had a pattern that, that everybody complied with so religiously. Uh, at each primary field, uh, main field is what, what the home field was called. Uh, and this was required by, by the Army. You, know, you had to have auxiliary fields, auxiliary landing sites. Uh, the aircraft would take off from the main field. They would go to the auxiliary fields and practice landings and takeoffs and maneuvers. The 
uh, Corsicana had a satellite field, which is a small version of the main field. They had a hard surface runway. Uh, they had a building with a control uh, tower uh, on it. They had fuel and a crash truck uh, based at that fuel at that field, uh, as well as a fire uh, truck. The uh, where the auxiliary fields did not have those. Auxiliary fields were just basically uh, pastures that were suited for landing the aircraft. The auxiliary fields were spaced uh, about 10 miles from the main field in, in different quadrants of the county. While congestion was a major worry for the pilots and ground personnel, communication with aircraft was another problem. As mentioned, training planes were not equipped with radios. Any communication between other aircraft or the ground had to be done with flags and other established signals, so colliding with another airplane was not the only worry. Even communications between the instructor and cadet in the same plane was limited. You had a, a, a very crude set, set up uh, from one to the other uh, was through a, uh, well, I guess you would call it a communication, but uh, you were really talking through a, just a pipe to each other. They had no radio communication uh, because the airplanes had no electronics. So the instructor would establish a system with the cadets. This is how you pass information to me while we're in the air. Now, the instructor could talk to the cadet through a Gosport system, a tube that he would speak into, and the cadet in the back seat had tubes that were built into their helmets that they would plug in the other end of the Gosport tube. So the instructor could speak to the cadet and give them directions on what maneuvers he wanted them to do or correct whatever situation they were in. But the cadet could not, in turn, speak back to the instructor. Uh, so the, the way he communicated with the instructor was by shaking the control stick or uh, the, the, there was a mirror on the windshield in the instructor's cockpit so he could see the cadet and so they could use hand gestures, hopefully good hand gestures, to inform the instructor on what he wanted to do. Uh, a lot of instructors were not patient with that method, uh, so there was a lot of stick shaking and knee bashing with the control stick. And just like everybody else in the Army, the pilots received the same no-nonsense training that drill sergeants heaped on regular recruits. They imposed discipline, exercise, and adherence to newly created traditions that were all designed to make being a military pilot survivable, even the seemingly ridiculous tasks. Okay, well, you get up early. Uh, you, as an underclassman, you had to uh, run or trot to the mess hall with your arms outstretched like an airplane, like that. And when you made a corner, you had to bank like that. <laughs> I mean, this is the, the kind of hazing, the upper class. And then that lasted for a week or so, and, and that was it. And when, in the, uh, when you're eating uh, in the mess hall, you had to eat a square meal. Well, that was you you have your fork and you put it in whatever piece of meat or a potato and you bring it up straight and then straight over to your mouth. <laughs> That's a square meal. Well, things like that were really fun. And so uh, then time marches on. We had our calisthenics and and then on, uh, on Sunday, uh, we, we never flew on Sunday, so, and we were off. I went into town and got to know the town, went to church and uh, met the people. The day was split up half flying and half ground school. And like today, you would have ground school of a morning, you'd fly in the afternoon. The next day, you would fly of a morning and have ground school in the, in the afternoon. And uh, th th this went on for the, com the complete 10-week period. 
It was a daily routine. One of the differences between regular Army training and the pilot training program was that aviators were not required to run in rain or mud carrying a full pack. However, the cadets did have a full schedule, but had time for some relaxation and fun as well. In the evening, uh, you were relaxed and you could read, uh, uh, just shoot the breeze, uh, and, and that was it. And usually uh, you were tired and turned in. They had talent shows that in the Corsicana High School Auditorium. Uh, these young men apparently had, had some of them very talented. Some of them were kind of, you know, off the wall goofball kind of stuff, but there were some, some serious uh, musical talents and whatever. Letter writing was not one of the skill sets demanded by the flight instructors. And as happens, I'll get to it tomorrow was a common theme at the schools. After all, the pilots were caught up in their training. To help keep family and friends apprised of the school's activities and life as a trainee, the pilots wrote and published a newsletter. This simple publication became a lifeline of information for those back home. The Flying Lines, which was a newsletter that was published here by the cadets, were often used to uh, send home to the family members to let them know what they were doing while they were here for their nine or 10 weeks and during training. And they, they had everything from uh, dances to sports events. Uh, it showed them doing their exercises um, and their classroom training. It was just a glimpse of what life was like at Corsicana Field. The field was not a prison in isolation. It was close to a town built on an oil boom just a couple of decades earlier. It offered ample attraction for the trainees when they were allowed off base. Where many places saw a military facility as a source of potential problems, Corsicana was open to the airmen and welcomed them with true Texas hospitality. Even so, many people in the community had no idea that the base was host to hundreds of new faces every year. Even though the community's population was only 15,230, 8,480 cadets passed through training at the field without causing a major disruption in peace and security. These were very small farm communities for both the people here and for many of the people like my uncle came from a very small rural community. This was, you know, this was a big world for them and it was something for the people in Texas to see someone from another part of the country because it's not like today where people travel around. The, the community of Corsicana just embraced these cadets because their own sons were somewhere. There, there was hardly a family in the United States that did not have in some way, directly or indirectly, uh, family members and loved ones who were involved in the military. And so they took the attitude of, we hope communities where our boys are will we'll take care of them like we're going to take care of these, these young men who are here. Uh, and so uh, every arriving class, when they came here, there was a, there was a dance at the country club. Uh, there were various other social activities in the, in the community. Every Sunday, churches would, would bring the young men into town for, for uh, church services. Anyway, the first Sunday, I went in and I went to church. I'm a, a Presbyterian, and, and when I came out of the church, this couple asked me, their, in fact, their daughter, the Stells, Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Stell, and their daughter, Betty. Uh, they approached me and said, would you like to come home to dinner with us? Well, a home-cooked meal after uh, the military food, although it was good. Uh, yes, that would be wonderful. So I got to know that family. The citizens of Corsicana would invite the cadets to their, house, their homes on Sunday for Sunday uh, meals, and on holidays, the cadets couldn't, couldn't leave, so they would bring the cadets to their homes in town uh, they put on dances for them. They had a, uh, as was typical of every every town in the U.S. during the war, uh, they had a recreation center downtown. Uh, 
Uh, they had auxiliaries that supported uh, the cadets. If you look at any newspaper from that time period, it's full of social events that were being put on by the city for the cadets. I remember my buddy and I were at the uh, counter uh, having a sandwich for lunch on a Sunday, and this couple came up to us, and uh, they said, our son is in the service, and we're glad to have you here. And they asked about where we were from, and said, and then they said, would you, we have a small ranch on the edge of town, would you like to come out and see it? Oh, boy. So my buddy and I, we went out to their ranch, and we got on the horses in the corral, and it, it was really wonderful. In the days back then before Facebook and Snapchat and uh, whatever, Instagram, they had other ways to communicate. In fact, there was a, a utility pole downtown that functioned as a uh, kind of a bulletin board. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what corner it was on, but they, they would put notices and announcements and whatever else down there. And a lot of the subjects uh, of those announcements involved the uh, female population in Corsicana. And I talked to one old gentleman, and I wished I'd gotten his name. But he said he was looking on that one day, and he saw a, a statement on there, a, a, an, an announcement, about a young lady, and she was described as being very pretty and very nice. And he said, that's the kind of girl I'm looking for. And so he just asked somebody there on the street, do you know her? Yeah, there she is, right over there. So he went over and introduced himself, asked her out. A relationship developed. They got married and were married for 50 plus years uh, after the war. A lot of those cadets found their spouses here. Some came back to live here over the years. Uh, but, but relationships developed not only among the cadets, but among the local community, even to the point of uh, matrimony. You know, and part of that is the citizens of Corsicana, as they saw these classes coming and going, they knew that some of the first cadets that came through Corsicana that they met were already overseas and some of them weren't coming back. So as the war went on, their uh, feelings toward these cadets really grew to, to uh, appreciate them. As training progressed towards its conclusion, it would eventually be time for the cadets to take to the sky alone, to take their solo flight. Well, the solo flights were a judgment call on the part of the flight instructor. And uh, most of the students would solo at around nine hours. Some would go 10, some 11. Once in a while, he'd have a relay, and he'd go eight. But if, the, if they had to take 12 hours to solo, you had to turn them in to the chief pilot, and he had to give them a flight test because they didn't want to spend any more money on that guy, maybe. I was the last one to solo, and when I came back and they saw, you're allowed to wear your goggles up on the helmet once you solo. And I came walking in late in the afternoon. My goggles were up there, and they, they got the signal, and they grabbed me and <laughs> threw me in the shower. That was the way you were baptized after you solo. So uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. Directional control is very, very important. So they had to be able to hold the airplane as straight as a string on the takeoff and on the touchdown. And then they had to do stalls in flight, and steep turns, and S turns across a road. And they had to make good approaches on landings. And uh, the landings is where the, where the rub come in. And some instructors were better at teaching people to land than others. And then some students just could reach proficiency in landings earlier than others. But we had to, we had to have a feeling that this guy could, could take off and solo and not damage the airplane or hurt himself. 
and uh, we wanted we wanted a little bit of space above that. And of course, we would only solo the guy when conditions were good. Not everything went as smooth as planners hoped. As stated, some flight instructors were too lax in their attitude to meet the standards of precision flyers. Others were too lenient toward their students and passed on underachievers who should have been washed out. Both attitudes could lead to disaster on the front lines. After a number of complaints from Army observers, these instructors were reined in or let go, a hard choice to make considering their flying abilities. Whether it was the lack of proper instruction, mechanical problems, or simply circumstance, training accidents took a sizable toll in cadets, instructors, and machines. The safety record at Corsicana Field was uh, remarkable in comparison to a lot of other fields. In the course of the three and a half years, it was operational. Uh, there were 13 fatalities uh, of cadets and instructors. The, but there were accidents uh, almost on a daily basis, uh, airplanes colliding on the ground, uh, hard landings, that type of thing. Uh, these, were, these were men who virtually had never been in airplanes before, and so they were very hard on the aircraft, and the maintenance departments uh, worked nonstop, 24 hours a day, keeping up with uh, the aircraft. Uh, one particular incident, which was a national, had national implications, uh, a wing came off of one of the PT-19s in flight, and, and uh, uh, an instructor and cadet were both killed in that accident. And because of that particular accident, all PT-19s in the country were grounded. Uh, and so that particular incident brought to a halt training uh, for a number of days until the Army could investigate why this happened. And as it turned out, it was uh, shoddy workmanship on, on the part of a contractor where it was rebuilding the wings down in the Houston area. And so they redirected, reinitiated new uh, procedures and got the airplanes back up in the air and, uh, and only missed a few days of flying. But, um, but that one incident was magnified over the whole country uh, and, and cost a lot of time and money. We had had a uh, dry season early in 1943, and as a, as a result, at the fence lines, the dirt had like the fence lines here, the dirt had piled up here and here surrounding that field because it had a three-wire fence. And I had a cadet that was on his first solo, and he came around and he forgot to, to close the throttle and he went clear across the airport, just slowing down only to about 20 miles an hour. He was, he was at high idle, and he wasn't using the brakes or thing, and he hit one of those piles of dirt, and it, that airplane went up in the air about six or eight feet and stalled, and the nose came down, and fortunately, he wasn't any higher than that, and that airplane just hit three point on the gear, and it didn't damage it. An example of of routine maintenance incidents that, that occurred in uh, early 43, uh, a cadet uh, took off and his wheel departed the airplane. And he didn't know that, but the people on the ground saw that. And so an effort was made to notify him that, that he was gonna have to land the airplane without one wheel or he, they gave him the option to bail out. What, the way they did that is the commander of the field, uh, Major Ford, took off in another PT-19, and they flew up next to the cadet, and with a chalkboard, he wrote messages on the chalkboard and held them up so the cadet could, could read it, told him that his wheel had fallen off and that uh, he needed to either bail out of the airplane, which he uh, gave a hearty no to, uh, or prepare to land it with one wheel. And so he opted to land it with one wheel, and he did so successfully. 
the pilot of that airplane was named uh, Kursky, and Cadet Kursky successfully landed the airplane with one wheel uh, and made it through all of his training, uh, made it to his squadron assignment in the European theater where he was killed in action uh, flying P-40s. Another occasion uh, was when Cadet Thomas McGuire had taken off on a solo training flight. Uh, and during his flight, a squall came through and all the aircraft, since they weren't able to communicate with the aircraft, uh, were flagged. They used flag signals from the ground to tell all aircraft they needed to land before the squall came in. And all aircraft did except for Cadet McGuire's and they thought uh, that he was missing. And after the squall passed, uh, a pair of binoculars from the control tower noticed a aircraft down at the end of the, the runway and uh, they saw the airplane and saw that it was McGuire's airplane but he wasn't near the airplane and and they found that he was underneath a tree nearby and had uh, dived in uh, behind the squall and landed. Accidents continued in the more advanced pilot training, averaging about 35 a month for the bombers and 139 to 274 a month for fighter pilots across the country. As in many training situations where people were working closely together on an important and dangerous task, it was not uncommon for a unique bond to develop between the teacher and the student. And one of the men who, who was a, 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 a flight instructor out there was Tillman Reed. And he said a, a really unique bond developed between instructors and those cadets. And, and he said, we instructors understood and realized what an important job we had. This is a life or death situation. And if these men don't know what they're doing, they, they can not only jeopardize their own lives, but also the lives of, of other people. And so uh, he, he said, we, they had a ratio of about uh, three to four cadets per instructor. Uh, and so they, they developed a real close-knit relationship. And he said even 30, 40 years after the war was over, he would get visits from those cadets that he had, he had trained out there uh, because, because of that, that closeness. Um, it was a difficult job and, and a dangerous job. Many trainees entered the program with dreams of being ace fighter pilots or flying a massive bomber. As anyone with military service knows, the dreams of the individual give way to the needs of the service. When the cadets finished here, the civilian uh, operator had nothing to do with where they went. You had primary here, then you had basic, and they went to schools all around. They were all over this country because you could uh, fly in 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 more challenging positions and fly more challenging weather and everything. And they got night flying and and uh, everything. They got a, about 35 hours of that. They all took the basic. Then the split came and they divided them up into bomber pilots and fighter pilots. And then if they were fighter pilots, they went to a P-40 school and, and later a P-51 school. And there they got gunnery and so forth and advanced acrobatics and all this sort of stuff. Upon completion of the advanced phase, they would receive their uh, wings and also uh, con commission as a second lieutenant in the Army. Uh, then after that completion of advanced training, they would go to what they call transition training which would be to either single engine or multi-engine, uh, depending on what they were selected for, uh, and would be like fighter training or bomber training or transport training. Uh, at that point, they were uh, pretty much destined for wherever they're, what squadron they were gonna go to. And uh, if they were gonna be a fighter pilot, they would be assigned to a fighter squadron and transition into that squadron for deployment. Uh, same with a cargo or, or uh, bomber pilot. Remember the training lasted 50 weeks altogether. You went to five different air bases, 10 
uh, weeks at each place. Despite the high demand, the government did require a high level of skill and discipline before moving on to more advanced combat training. Focus on the coursework was required. One would consider that reasonable, considering that the lives of fellow crew members or a wingman would be at stake once the pilot reached the front, not to mention the cost of an expensive aircraft. Even if a student failed to meet all the requirements to continue on with the cadet program, the Army still had invested a great amount of training in the individual. Once the cadet had reached this phase of their training, the Army felt they were too valuable to the Air Force to put them back into the draft pool or put them, put them in the infantry or something like that. So they almost always found a position within the Air Force uh, to move them. In most cases, we found uh, washouts in primary or basic phase. Uh, the men were sent to gunnery school and became uh, gunners on bombers. Uh, and a lot of cases, they were transferred to uh, pi uh, navigator or bombardier school. I don't think I... Uh, I don't remember washing out over one. And the one guy I uh, had to wash out was a Brazilian, and he was <laughs> homesick for his girlfriend that uh, he just didn't even try to fly. One day, uh, not long after getting into the airplane up in uh, northern Texas, I, I thought, well, it would be fun to hedge hop. Well, I hedge hopped over some, somebody that turned me in. And they got the number of my plane, and, and the colonel called me in. And uh, I said, uh, he said, uh, Cadet Walsh, I understand you like to fly low. And uh, he says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to transfer you to the glider program. You have flying gliders. Those are low and slow. I brought it on myself, and so I couldn't blame anybody. I was uh, just a young kid <laughs> doing a stupid thing. While Cadet Walsh was transferred to the glider program later in his training, he did graduate from primary at Corsicana Field. Then, after the Army made changes to the glider program, he was again given the exam to re-enter the cadet program. And uh, so, I passed the exam again, this time a, a little higher than most. And they said, we're, we're classifying you as a navigator. I said, no, 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 but I'm a glider pilot. I want to fly. He says, no, we need navigators and bombardiers, and you're it. You, we'll, you have a high enough score, and we'll, we'll let the dumb ones become pilots. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I ended up as a bombardier navigator, eventually in the 9th Air Force in B-26, Martin Marauders. In the final count, about 220 air servicemen died a day in the European phase of the war. Of the 276,000 aircraft manufactured in the U.S. alone, 41,575 were lost in combat training accidents, and equipment malfunctions. Few people alive today can fully understand what a devastating loss that was in personnel. When you consider that a standard bomber crew consisted of 10 men, by the end of the war, air combat losses counted for over 40,000 men killed, 18,000 wounded, and 41,000 captured. More than half of those captured in the Pacific theater did not survive the war. Add to that the 9.7 billion gallons of gasoline consumed from 1942 to 1945, the almost 460 billion rounds of aircraft ammunition fired overseas, and the 7.9 million bombs dropped in over 2.3 million combat sorties, and the sheer cost to send a plane into combat is staggering. And that is just in the U.S. You need to add in Britain, Germany, Italy, Japan, China, and numerous smaller countries to the figures to reach numbers that are all but inconceivable. Now, overseas, I 
rarely remember names except our commanding officer and a couple of the uh, ranking officers uh, because, uh, you know, if you lost a buddy, if you knew them too well, it, it really hit you. While the war in Europe seemed to drag on and casualties mounted beyond all expectations, eventually, after the decimation of Dresden, Hamburg, and Berlin, the Nazi resistance crumbled. But the war still raged in the Pacific. However, the Navy began to carry a heavier load of the fighting. And with fewer land bases to stage raids, the need for pilots began to taper off. By late 1944, particularly as these training facilities, these civilian uh, flight schools, uh, the government began to shut those down uh, by late 1944. The one here in Corsicana was closed in November of, of 44. Uh, obviously, the war is going to go ahead for another six, eight months. But uh, the, the need, it, well, we didn't have the, the, uh, the need in Europe that we'd had uh, prior. And so the, the number of, of uh, pilots uh, diminished considerably. And so we didn't shut it off altogether, but, but it began to, uh, to kind of dwindle down uh, during that period. The last class at Corsicana was class 45C, uh, which was disbanded in the middle of their training here when the field uh, was ordered to be closed. Uh, the members of the class were sent to other primary fields or to bombardier school or navigator school. Uh, at that point in the war, the focus was being shifted to the eventual uh, invasion of Japan and the need for Navigators and bombardiers was critical at that point. Uh, this did not set well with a lot of potential pilot candidates who wanted to be pilots, but uh, ultimately it was what was best for the effort. While in training, many of the faces were anonymous, though some known figures like Jimmy Stewart did end up in a cockpit during the heat of battle. But most trainees went on, at least those who survived, to become just another guy next door. A few, however, made their own waves in post-war America, some by way of Corsicana, Texas. There were many notable cadets that came through Corsicana. Uh, some were notable before they got here. Uh, well, William Allen was a protege of Orson Welles in the movie-making uh, business and was actually played the reporter in the movie Citizen Kane. Uh, and he trained through here, went on to be a fighter pilot, uh, and then resumed his uh, Hollywood career after the war was over. Uh, other notables, uh, Eugene Roddenberry, the creator of the Star Trek series, trained here as a young cadet. But he went on to fly B-17s off of Guadalcanal in the South Pacific. Uh, one distinguished flying cross for doing that. Uh, and after the war, became an a airline pilot and continued his riding career, which was highly influenced by his uh, wartime uh, exploits. Uh, the uh, other military notables, uh, uh, Thomas McGuire, Medal of Honor recipient, number two ace for the US in World War II, uh, with 38 combat victories. He was killed in action. Uh, January 7th of 45. Uh, uh, his remains were exhumed in 48, and he was brought back and buried in Arlington Cemetery. McGuire Air Force Base is named for Tommy McGuire. One of the cadets that came through Corsicana, uh, he went on to fly P-51s, P-47s in Europe. Uh, his name was uh, George Lit Lichter. Uh, after the war, and he was of, of uh, Jewish faith. After the war, uh, when uh, the state of Israel was trying to form and gain their liberty, uh, they put out the call for anyone that was willing to help their armed forces to, to come. And Mr. Lichter answered the call and went over and used his uh, knowledge and training to train the very first Israeli Air Force, uh, which fought in uh, the 48 war. And, uh, and he trained uh, vir virtually the, the beginning of the Israeli Air Force that we see today. Lieutenant General Jay Robbins trained here. 
Uh, he had 22 aerial victories in the South Pacific, uh, went on to uh, lead many departments in the Air Force, uh, was born in Coolidge and grew up in Coolidge, Texas, which is in Limestone County. The, uh, and there's, there's many, many, many uh, generals and uh, notable people that got their flying career started right here at Corsicana. This is the first airplane they flew and went on to distinguish flying careers. Uh, the leaders of our military and the Air Force in particular uh, that started as cadets at Corsicana went on to be combat leaders in Vietnam, Korea, uh, uh, virtually every conflict since World War II. Uh, so this was, a, this was a training ground for the future of our armed forces. Corsicana Field was eventually decommissioned with training ending on the 15th of November and closing of the gates on the 15th of December, 1944. With the drawdown of the Army Air Force's pilot training program, the field was declared surplus in 1945. But the facility did not fall into obscurity, as did so many of the other training fields in other parts of the country. At that point, the uh, field became a storage facility for the War Assets Administration, where they brought in uh, materiel from all over the country, stored it here in the hangars for disposal uh, to whatever areas that they needed to go. It did that for a year under contract. Uh, at that point in 46, the uh, city of Corsicana, uh, Mayor Calhoun, was attempting to convince the city that they needed to utilize the field as a municipal airport uh, and he was meeting resistance to that because there was already an airport uh, in town. Uh, and this was way out of town for the city, uh, the city commissioners. Uh, so he was back and forth to Washington, D.C., trying to work a deal with the Army, and the Army was saying, you know, we're going to sell these hangars and facilities off if you don't decide pretty soon. And indeed, uh, one hangar was sold and moved down to College Station. Uh, where it remained until last year. Uh, the, and they were about to remove another hangar when the city commission <clears throat> was, was posed with the idea that if they wanted to start a junior college in Corsicana, then they had the perfect facility for doing that right here with classrooms and, and dorm rooms and hangars for uh, uh, training uh, people uh, for vocations. And so that idea convinced the city commission that it was worth acquiring the airport uh, for their purposes as well as using it for the college. Some local educators, uh, Mr. Norwood, who was the superintendent of schools here, uh, said now's the time to do this. We can get this facility out here for nothing. It's available. We got a student body. We got all these young men coming home from the war. The economy cannot absorb them all. There's not going to be enough jobs. We're converting back to, uh, from military to a peacetime economy. Congress had just passed one of the most significant laws that they have ever done called the GI Bill. Uh, so these young men are going to have money to go to college. If we have a college right here, they will use their GI money to, to stay home. Uh, so we got a campus, we got a student body, let's do it. A lot of these guys who came back from the war had no intention of going to college. You know, they're just going back to the farm or going back to the factory. And so we revolutionized a whole generation here. And instead of blue collar workers in the factory or farm hands, uh, we're gonna produce engineers and accountants and educators and lawyers and doctors uh, from, from individuals who, who had no idea that they'd ever move into that professional class of, of, of the economy. Uh, so, so some vision on the part of Congress, on the part of civilians, on, on the part of the whole country, uh, and, and what a change it brought to, to, to our whole society. Navarro College was started here in 47, uh, and mainly was uh, catering to returning veterans uh, and training them new vocations and, and uh, getting them educations. 
Uh, and the college was here until 1952, and they moved out to their current site. Uh, and meanwhile, the municipal airport operated here uh, out of one of the hangars. Uh, there were ag services out of here, uh, uh, flight school, which Mr. Cumbie operated, and, uh, uh, and it kept the airport alive. After Navarro College moved to a larger campus, taking along some of the buildings for dormitories, etc., Corsicana Field continued as Corsicana Municipal Airport. The field expanded into a modern facility, serving a wide range of privately owned aircraft and charter planes. It was when Gary and Sarah Farley arrived to work at the airport that the field's past was given a new life in the form of a museum. When we came to the airport, uh, my husband started his business in 1996, and I started visiting before I actually came in 2000. The three photos on the wall um, in this particular room uh, were, they just showed, they showed there were pictures of the airfield, and that is actually the beginning of the museum. And there was just so much in those photos, it was hard to ignore. And we just looked into it further, and the further we uh, studied about it, the more we realized that a museum needed to be started. The photographs and uh, artifacts, uh, they, were, they were all sent in. They were all either brought by, uh, people coming back to visit, they saw what we were doing. Um, they wanted a place to house them. Uh, they thought it was a good place to send them. The Glenn Cumby Museum of Aviation and Military History, named after the civilian airport's first administrator and a mechanic during its training days, originally occupied two rooms in the terminal, but has now grown to include part of an aircraft hangar with different exhibits. Great care has been taken to preserve the accuracy of the items on display, including a rare collection of uniforms. The museum boasts a collection, the Marshall Thixton Library, consisting of periodicals, manuals, newspapers, and a variety of documents from the soldiers who passed through the training program. Plans to expand the museum into a new building are in the fundraising and development stages. In conjunction with the museum, there has been a memorial erected where many of the field's buildings once stood. A bronze statue representing all the cadets who passed through Corsicana stands as part of the memorial to honor those who worked, trained, and died there. Here at Corsicana, we consider this to be a site where men gave their lives for their country because of the 13 men that died in training here. They died here just as if they had died in the combat theater. They gave all for their country, and we try to honor that in everything we do. After many years of fundraising, uh, lots of donations, lots of gen generous donations, uh, many grants, uh, we finally had enough to go forward with creating the memorial. It consists of five acres. Uh, the bronze statue being a large part of the expense. Uh, on the statue, it took almost nine years working with the sculptress uh, to get that developed just, just right. I walked um, to the monument uh, at Corsicana uh, and uh, just, just to go and look at that and just, just to think about the activities that were going on and the men that were there and, and that my uncle was part of it. And it just, it's a special feeling. And you look back and you, all those guys, uh, you know, when you look, look at their pictures now and in many of the books that, that was produced by the Army Air Corps, you look at their faces and they're just, they're just boys. Uh, having the, uh, the statue at Corsicana does uh, put this uh, place on the map and in the memory of people, it, it'll be uh, uh, enjoyed even more a century from now. As it turned out, air power over Europe and eventually Japan proved to be a deciding factor in winning the war. 
The top members of the Air Corps, starting with General Hap Arnold and the civilian pilot school owners, believed that it was possible to do the impossible. The civilian training program was a major success. Air power was here to stay and continues to be the cornerstone of the modern military. As far as the legacy of air activities of Texas, Corsicana Field stands as a rare reminder of a major turning point in United States history. This airport and that statue and that associated material out there on Corsicana Airport, this place is one, one out of a hundred. Most of these places have, they do, there's nothing even left of them. They don't even know that there's been an airport there. Without these historic sites and museums, history cannot be passed on to current and future generations. Our history has to be preserved, or as the saying goes, we may be doomed to repeat it. I think it's so important not only to preserve this memory, but to get it out to other people. Because we have people getting out of college today that are just not very well orientated in what to do in the real world. And they don't realize without looking back on this that there's blood, sweat, and tears that make this country great today. And by God, they ought to be saluting the damn flag and giving their fellow man some respect and working to help his, they, their fellow man and working to make this country great. And hopefully, guys will look back on this and say, those old guys knew how to do it. By God, they won two wars, fought, fought two wars at a time, and, and won them both. You can judge from me that I am a patriot, by God, and proud of it. The name Air Activities of Texas faded away after its closure and the principals and investors returned to their pre-war occupations. The importance that the field played in the prosecution of the war is represented by the sacrifices made by the Corsicana graduates, instructors, military staff, and even those who washed out of the program and went on to serve in other positions in the Air Corps. The estimated fatality rate of men associated with Corsicana Field during the war is about 7% based on current research and does not include the wounded. One probable reason for the high mortality rate is that air activities of Texas was established prior to Pearl Harbor and many of its early class members were some of the first to see combat. Those that trained at Corsicana Field went on to fly essentially every type of aircraft in the Army during World War II, from single-engine liaison airplanes to the largest four-engine bombers and transports. Afterwards, these men were among the first to make the transition to jet aircraft and pioneered the modern methods of today's aerial combat. Over 70 years later, the spirit of the facility lives on in its remaining buildings and the few individuals left who served there. Stan Walsh ended up finishing out the war in the 9th Air Force in a B-26 Martin Marauder, having flown 65 missions as a bombardier navigator. He returned to the States after Germany's surrender, got married, earned a degree from the University of Southern California, and became a civil engineer. He recently served as editor-in-chief of the book the B-26 goes to war. Ray Blake Jr. later became an Army flight instructor himself. He served 22 years between active duty and the reserves, reaching the rank of major. 
After the war, he was married, built houses, and operated a restaurant for 44 years in West Virginia. As a veteran of Corsicana Field, Ray also made a substantial financial contribution to the establishment of the memorial, and even served as a model for the cadet statue itself. Virgil Radcliffe flew fighters in the war after his training was complete, eventually reaching the rank of captain. After returning from his tour in North Africa, he was killed in a Florida training accident in 1944. Vern Foster left air activities of Texas in 1943. He has flown all over the world with the Air Transport Command and United Airlines, logging over 23,000 hours of flight time in a multitude of aircraft types, from the Fairchild PT-19 to Boeing 737s. Vern also consulted on the design of the Memorial Cadet statue that is located at the field today. At 101 years old, he has returned to Corsicana Field to participate in this program. I just told Sarah a while ago, so, sometime during this afternoon, I want you and I to just walk out on that ramp. And will you just walk out there and stand with me for five minutes while I just soak this all in and realize that I'm really, after all this career, I'm back to where I started. I can't believe I'm here. You can't believe you're back? Yeah. I've been wanting to do this for so long. 